Hello YouTube, this is Sean, and it's such a wonderful morning that I thought I need to do this video. And I've been wanting to do this for the last few days, but I just haven't done it, because, you know... Well, first off, this whole playlist has been crickets since March. I really hope it hasn't been March. That'd make me really sad. I, oh gosh. If I found out that I haven't put anything in this playlist since March... Ooh, jeez. Um, but I kind of wanted to jump start with a new idea because one of the reasons I haven't done anything is because I was trying to find the perfect information for that last little mini series, the Misunderstood series. So I was like, huh, well, how about I sort of switch it up, do a little separate one, something to sort of mix a little series up. And so here we go. Here are five reasons why animals go extinct well five main reasons so we get a little specific into some of them but not a lot and the first reason is they are case strategists or they have a very low reproduction rate now in the in environmental science you learn that there are two different types of strategies for reproduction case strategists and art strategists case strategists well sorry we'll start with art strategists first art strategists are animals that produce a whole lot of young but they aren't really helped to survive they're more so the animals that lay 80 some eggs and leave them to sort of fend for themselves that's case strategists and normally well not case, that, that's our strategists um, and normally when that happens there's a mass breeding or a mass hatching that way it's not the idea of taking care of them for them to survive it's the idea of as many of them will survive there's so many of them that there will be a survival number so that's the R strategist system K strategist system is ooh, sorry, when animals only have a few young every couple of years but they care for that young as long as possible now this is sort of the good and bad side of that the good side of it is it ensures you have more percentage of your young that make it to adulthood because it has parental care, it has more, more sort of like learning with it. But the downside is because of your, because they don't have as many children and because they have them at so like like at sparse rates, it means that you're more susceptible for that child to die. Will not die. Um, more susceptible for that child to either for something bad to happen to it or for something bad to happen to you. So it's a risky but rewarding system. But in the case of endangered animals, it sort of pushes them to the edge. For example, the rhinoceros. They have a eight-year period just to be, just to become sexually mature after they're born. And then after they give birth, females will stay with their young for two years. And then they have another year and a half or year waiting period after their young is left before they breed again. That's almost, that's around, let's see, do the mental math. That's about 11 years that she can only produce one child. And then after that, it's three years that she can produce a child every three years. So yes that's good for the child because it gives it some sort of support but in case where animals are really close to extinction for example the white rhino where there's only one male left well there's only one known male left um it gets to be problematic because you have to find a way to line up his breeding cycle with the breeding cycle of females and i believe there was one female that had a baby so we weren't sure how long she had the baby for or if she was going to be up to breed soon so that's the first problem that's the first like um not problem um i don't know what to call it but that's the first um reason reason of course reason animals can go extinct another one is ecosystem degradation now i didn't say environmental i didn't say habitat i said ecosystem because there is a lot more to it than just cutting down a few trees in this animal's habitat. Now, the animal, well, the area I'm going to use is actually the Galapagos, because that's one of the really great examples of 
ecosystem degradation affecting plant and animal life. And so what we have is, well, the Galapagos Islands are a pristine island. They are so remote that there's only a few mammals that live there. There aren't any in, I don't believe, um, it was, there are only like a few mammals and the ones that are, are sea, are sea mammals because it's the only way they're going to get there. And so it's a really oddly but beautifully made island because everything connects to this and this, this and they all rely on each other and it's this is going to tie into one of the later ones but it's not so um it's not so um humanized i guess you could say and when people came of course we, of course we want we want to know what was there so we took a few animals off the island to study and some of them to eat we sort of left our own little things there and those became invasive species and the worst invasive species, invasive species of the islands was actually the um, the goats. Whalers, like back when the Galapagos was a great whaling stop, whalers would leave goats on the islands. That way, they could have meat and milk. Goat milk. Um, so that way, they could have meat and milk when they stopped by there on their whaling expeditions. So the goats actually outcompeted the um, Galapagos tortoises, actually taking most of their food and causing a whole lot of them to go extinct. And it's not a good thing because the tortoise itself, because of it's specialized, it doesn't need to move fast because there's nothing else that's going to be eating there. It doesn't need to have the ability to jump up onto things because it has no real competition for food. And when goats came along, they actually sort of pushed the Galapagos tortoise almost out of its own island. The Galapagos Islands are named after the tortoise, so it'd be kind of odd if the tortoise was pushed out of the Galapagos Islands if it was the namesake of the islands. Interesting. So a whole lot of them, like, Many of them actually died because they weren't getting enough food because the goats that, well, because the feral goats were going around and they were eating food faster and more efficiently and better than the tortoise were, which isn't good. And then you have, of course, as anywhere humans have been, we've left a cat or a dog. It's not good. It's not, it never ends good. It never, sorry, not good. It never ends well because cats are one of the most aggressively invasive species because they're so adaptable and they're so active and they're such active hunters. You won't see, you won't see a cat that's failing where it is because they find ways to figure things out. They are one of the most incredible animal family. Fila about it. I want to say families. They're one of the most incredible families because they're so adaptable to everything. And outside of that, they all... Oh, man. I'm sorry. I just woke up and I'm like, ooh. <laughs> um, they all want to find that one spot, that one little niche that nothing else has. And they always get to it. And that's where they sort of lock themselves into an area. And sometimes they'll make that niche by outcompeting other animals or sometimes it just happens not to be filled for example in the Galapagos Islands there aren't many real like land predators so dogs and cats sort of took that spot over and they took out a whole lot of the natural wildlife of the Galapagos Islands and it's not a good thing now this is where we get to the interesting part Number three is genetic complications. Now, I'm not, okay, genetic complications doesn't mean that two animals can't breed. It means that when they breed, it's not going to be a good thing, even though breeding is praised for native animals. It's not always the best. And the example I have for this is the Asiatic cheetah. 
because of how much they were hunted and like taken for pet trade and all that stuff back in the 90s, back in the 60s, 70s, and a little bit of the 80s. There's so few, there were so few of them there that practically now all of them are in the same gene pool. So breeding is going to be much harder for them and much less successful than it would have been if they had more of them out there. Um, a small gene pool is very hard to come from. And we'll talk about that in number five, but the Asiatic cheetah is, has had a gene pool that was so small that they have very few successful like child rings because the child are born of their uncle because because they're born of their uncle or their like older sibling because population is so small they have no one else to breed with and plus this goes into number four too which is a small range or a large and very defensive territory now as for small range we ha we take the pupfish and pupfish are if you don't know which I didn't know this until like a few days ago. This is really cool. Pupfish are only found in one pool in Arizona. It's the only place you're going to find them. And that's a good and bad thing. Good because it gives scientists a specific place that they can go find them. But bad meaning that if one thing happens to this island, island, one thing happens to this pool, the entire population is wiped out. And as for large territories, I had snow leopard because they they have territories that span 10 some miles of the Himalayas. And that makes it, one, great for them because they have a large area to hunt from. They have a large area to find a sort of base, as you could say, or a home. And it sort of keeps them separated from each other. But it comes at a cost when you're so separated that you can't find a mate in time to breed. So those are my two examples of small and large territories. And I also said I was going to touch on the Galapagos in number four. And this was because the islands are so small. And this goes with any sort of island in the world because they all practice with the same, have the same setup. You cannot let anything really bad happen to these islands because it's already on a wire. If you look at all the animals, they're on a pretty extreme lifestyle. Like, for example, hummingbirds. We think they're just, oh, they're really cute. Hummingbirds are probably the most extreme bird in the world. They have to eat every 15 minutes or they die of starvation. They go and because of the fact they have to eat every 15 minutes, they go into basically a nightly hibernation just to keep from dying of starvation in their sleep. You have hummingbird. There's so many different things people don't think about. You have to understand that, hey, this animal is so specifically adapted to where it is and what it does that if anything were to change, it would perish. So you have to think about that and the fact that the... It was one island, um, I want to say it was in Guam, or it was Guam, and it became Snake Island because there weren't any snakes on this island at one point, and, at, and someone, I think, was brought there accidentally, and they took over the island and wiped out all the native bird species. They brought in a single predator, and that wiped out the entire island. And that is true. That happens more than we'd like to know it happens. So you have to think that very small islands are really important. And they're really, really fragile. Like, I mean, they're like so fragile that if one thing happens, the entire island collapses. And with that, I'd like to go to number five because I recently learned about this animal and it has become my personal favorite and I love it so much. Number five is actually a lack of knowledge. Now this is a double-edged sword and I, 
I'm a little bit more, more lenient toward this, but it doesn't mean I'm okay with it. Um, we're going to start off with the Stellar Sea Cow. And you, most people don't know Stellar Sea Cow because it's extinct. It's been extinct for over 140 I want to say 140 years. No, because it was 20, not 20, it's 1850 something when it was discovered. Well, anyways, it was discovered by Mr. Stellar's, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Stellar, and he found it on an, on accident. He was sailing up around um, Greenland, and his boat actually sort of crashed, so they landed on an island until like it, it could be fixed, and he stumbled upon a large manatee relative and they were huge like 40 they were around um not 40 they were believed to be around 30 feet long and he documented every bit of information about it and including what they tasted like what their uses were and 27 years later the species was actually wiped out because he told everyone just of the uses of them not that were not what they were, there wasn't much account for their actual biology and their like what they did in the in their environment because old explorers didn't care about that. It was about what they could find, what what they could find, how it could be used, and basically that was it. And so Sao Chicao died because there wasn't much information about it. There wasn't much real people trying to help it. It took 27 years to wipe the entire species out. And the last example I have is the Vaquita. Now, Vaquita is probably the most endangered, well, potentially the most endangered mammal, but for sure the most endangered sea mammal. And it is a small porpoise. It, it's, I mean, small. It's so, it's extremely cute. So, if you guys ever get the opportunity, just Google search Vaquita, and it's extremely cute. But it's very sad because there's only believed to be about. Some scientists say generously, there's about five or six of them left in the wild. And that's compared to the fact that in 1994, there are believed to be about 2,000. That is a huge drop, and each year it based like each year since then it practically cut in half until we're here. Last year it was believed to be around 15. Year before 30. In 2004 it was believed to be there were a hundred, there were around 100 and 150, 130 some. And in 1994, not 94, 1997 there were believed to be about 200. So the population drops extremely fast. They actually had the a ninety a ninety seven percent decrease. I think it was of the last thing I looked at, um, and that's extremely dangerous because they're basically hunted, and we don't know much about them. We didn't know they existed until around the early nineties. So. We're basically trying to save them when we don't know much about them. All we're really getting from them is when we find them washed ashore, trapped in fisher's nets. Or when they happen to just very rarely pass by a camera and we get to see them. So what we do know about them is, unlike other porpoise and um, dolphin species, they're solitary. They live in very small groups and it's normally just a male a female and if they have a pup. Um, we believe that they live to be about 20, year, 20 years and we think that they have, um, it takes two years to reach sexual maturity and about that time and then the child might stay with their mom for around a year, we aren't sure. This is literally all guesswork because we don't have much information on it. And they're, caught, well, they're going extinct for bycatch and I'll go into that in another video but it's really bad because we don't know much about them and yet we're we're trying to save them because we don't know but we don't know much about them we only know that they're found in one area on the 
very northern tip of the Gulf of Mexico, not Gulf of Mexico, of the, um, of Baja, I forgot what that's called, Santa Cruz, not Santa Cruz, um, the little gulf between Baja California and Mexico, I can't remember the name of it, I feel really bad, someone's gonna leave it in the comments, and I don't know what it is, and I feel really bad, thank you for whoever does it, um, yeah, and it's, we, we know that they're only found there, and their population is shrinking so much that it's going to lead to low reproduction rate. And because we're fishing that area so heavy, so heavily, it's going to lead to ecosystem degradation. The low population is going to lead to genetic complications, and they have a small range. So they basically check all five of these off their list. Well... That was extremely depressing. And I really hope we find a way to save the vaquita in some way because they're gorgeous animals. They're actually called the pandas of the sea. And if you saw them, you'd understand why. The name vaquita means little cow and it's in Sp like in Spanish. Um, yeah, just do a little information, like Google search them. They're really cool. I love them. They're extremely cute and they're really little. Like, I mean, they're only they get a max of five feet and for sea mammals that's actually pretty small so definitely look them up like you could hold one up sort of like a baby and it wouldn't touch the ground and i'm like ah. <gasps> so yes i really hope you guys enjoyed this video i plan on doing these much more often than i have before because i feel really bad that i haven't done these because these these videos are what really makes me enjoy this so yeah have a great day, great morning, noon, night, evening, sunrise, sunset. If you're in space, I don't know what time it is. Yeah.